The launch of the Super Nintendo was one of the happiest times in my gaming life. Though I had been a major supporter of the Sega Genesis, I knew that Nintendo's new offering would bring with it first and third party software Sega's system would never have received. This meant entirely new experiences for me to dabble in, and I was ready to take the plunge. I would enjoy many games across the system's life, and in this episode we will be taking a look at my favorite 10 games for it. Like most great pieces of hardware, this was no easy thing. The Super Nintendo was loaded with countless games that could easily fit into a narrative of a best games list. My choices here are based on the all-around effect the games had on me. Graphics, sound, gameplay, and the timing of when I played them played a huge role in its position. Let's take a look at the 10 games that I feel were the best on Nintendo's mighty 16-bit entry. Let's go ahead and broach the honorable mentions category first. As I alluded to before, choosing just 10 out of a library of hundreds of solid titles means good games will be left behind. Pilot Wings was one of the first games I played and the influence of Mode 7 cannot be overstated in its appeal. Polygons have since dulled its impact, but in 1990 it was one of the most impressive special effects latent gameplay experiences out there. The impact of Street Fighter 2 was huge as well, a port of the massively popular arcade game that did more for the platform than perhaps any other single game in its entire run. The great Super Mario World was packed in when it was launched in the US, and its classic gameplay came with a ton of new additions that made it a joy to get lost in. The Contra series was represented by an incredible third entry called the Alien Wars and was a graphical showpiece that had tons of Mode 7 effects as well as two-player co-op. You had the oddball entries like Skyblazer that didn't really play much like anything else, yet blended a few different gameplay styles into something special. There are some out there that believe the Super Nintendo didn't have any decent shoot-'em-ups, yet R-Type 3 was one of my favorites that generation. It's loaded with great special effects and some pretty incredible stage designs. The system of course had its own Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game as well. Turtles in Time was an expanded port of the arcade game, kept the two-player co-op, and was an all-around spectacular effort that has legions of fans. I also spent many a night adventuring around in Zelda 3 A Link to the Past. This was like the original NES game on steroids. It has a better told story, an amped up presentation, and a world that was split across two dimensions for a huge adventure. If you go into it without any help, it can provide dozens of hours of gameplay easily. Number 10 comes in as one of my favorite beat-em-ups on the platform. Unlike the atrocious Sega Genesis version, this actually looked and sounded like the movie, and the gameplay and settings have enough variety and style to hold up for an entire playthrough. It's divided up into a few different styles of play. Sometimes you are going along pure Final Fight style punching and grappling enemies, and sometimes you are in more of a platforming style type of play, where you use your batarangs as your main attack and can use your grappling hook to avoid dangers. There were even movie-like intermissions that played out the story, which again, followed the movie closely. Konami did a really solid job here, and since I was a big fan of the movie, it landed with me in a way that made it unforgettable. Believe it or not, RPGs were not a favorite of mine for a very long time. Growing up as an arcade kid, they were often too wordy and light on white-knuckled thrills. 
I had of course played a handful of RPGs on the Genesis, but it was the Super Nintendo that introduced me to the Square-based properties, and Chrono Trigger was easily one of the best. I often speak of how an RPG's characters make the entire experience for me. Most of the stories in RPGs are utterly pointless outside of a means to move along the settings and enemies you face. The real power of the tale hinges entirely on the camaraderie of its participants, and these characters make for a powerful group. They genuinely care for one another. You want to help them right from the beginning, and perhaps most important of all, you understand their motivations and dedications to one another. RPGs rarely have a heart and soul at this level, and it easily earns its spot on my list for it. I was never really a big fan of Prince of Persia because of the setting and time constraints, but when Blackthorn came along in 1994, I was immediately captivated by its revenge-based sci-fi story, gunplay, alien world, and exploration elements. I love the way you can take cover in the background during gunfights, and every item must be carefully considered before you use them. The animation here is brilliant and stands out in a presentation that is excellent overall. It impressed me so much I was excited for the 32X version, which adds even more content. Sometimes a particular type of game just needs the right setting and gameplay hook, and Blackthorn here hit the nail on the head for cinematic platformers for me. This may come as a surprise to many of you, but I was not a big fan of the original Mega Man games on the NES. I thought they were okay, but the reappearing enemies and presentation just didn't grab me as something special back then. Man, did that all change when Mega Man X came along. The graphics and sound improved tremendously, giving it a rock star look and feel that the NES games never had for me. Gameplay was ratcheted up as well and your charged shots, wall slides, wall jumps, and every other part of the gameplay felt better and more responsive. And that right there is the difference between a good game and a special game. When the stars align and everything falls into place to make a piece of software stand out, you never forget it. Mega Man X was the total package, and one of Capcom's best on the system. The power and allure of Mode 7 will likely be lost on you unless you lived its introduction. And what an introduction it was with F-Zero, Nintendo's hover car racing game. At a time when home racing games were choppy shadows of much more impressive arcade offerings, it stood apart as a technical marvel. Smooth, fast, and with a depth of its environment that was shocking at the time, F-Zero felt as if it was pulled straight out of a $10,000 arcade cabinet not some rinky-dink home console. The best part is, it wasn't just some shallow showpiece for the Mode 7 technology, as it also happened to sound and play great too. It could be unforgiving to newbies, but once you got a few races under your belt, the controller was an extension of your will, and the on-screen action played out exactly how you wanted it. Again, 3D polygons have since aged this technology to the point of novelty but when it was first available, it was nothing short of revolutionary for the home racing genre. Out of left field was ActRaiser, a mixed action platformer with RPG and world building elements. This one was a shocker from the moment I fired it up. 
You are a god who has returned from hibernation after your defeat at the hands of the evil Tandra. Now you must regain your powers by rebuilding the world and gaining followers to help you find magic and gaining additional levels. Part of the game is just a straight hack and slash platformer that has you dispatching enemies and bosses, while the other half of the game has you engaging your followers in city building and missions to grow your strength. Get an area strong and self-sufficient and you can move on to a new area to rebuild. There was nothing quite like it and the brilliant visuals and orchestral soundtrack were just icing on this wonderfully unique game. Super Mario All-Stars was something of an oddity upon its release. It was a level of generosity that Nintendo didn't offer up very often. Not just one remake of a classic franchise, but four in one single game. Here you get Super Mario Bros., Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, which was really just Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan. Also here is the US release of Mario 2, which was actually not originally a Mario game at all. And of course you get the much beloved Super Mario 3 in all of its Tanuki Suit goodness. It was all brought together in a game pack that allowed you to save your progress in every game, and they all saw big upgrades in color, art assets, and music. Since Mario 2 was my favorite among these titles, Nintendo had essentially made one of my favorite NES titles new again, so I was all over it immediately. The value proposition at the time was unbeatable, and I squeezed every ounce of gameplay I could from it. Final Fantasy had been a series that I didn't play much on the 8-bit NES. When they started showing up on the Super Nintendo, I began to take notice because of all the hype and talk amongst my friends. When I got around to Final Fantasy 3, which was actually just part 6, but thanks to some missed entries at the time, the names got all out of whack, I was enthralled immediately. It was easy to get into, had some great music, and again the characters were immediately likable and you understood their calls. Their interactions just bolstered the experience, and the bad guys here were on point and you just loved to hate them. There was plenty to explore and discover, and by the time it was all done, you had met a cast of characters that you'd want to relive the adventure all over again. It was Square's finest 16-bit work in my opinion, and one that easily could be argued as number one on my list. As a kid, I was in love with the idea of Metroid on the NES. In practice though, I spent much of the time lost and quickly got tired of it. When Nintendo released Super Metroid, all was quickly forgotten and I was blown away by how well this new adventure was reworked. New additions like a save and map system made a hell of a difference, but it was also chock full of upgrades for your suit and weapons that went well above and beyond the original. Even better, you get a huge upgrade in visuals and sound as well. And I don't mean just your usual run-of-the-mill color improvements. This is Point Blank one of the best looking and sounding games of its era, and it holds up well in these categories today. Expertly told, expertly laid out, and expertly paced, a platforming adventure that had no equal on any of Nintendo's rival machines. My number one game came early in the life of the system and established itself with such force you knew the Super Nintendo was going to be something special. 
This is essentially a re-envisioning of the original Castlevania. The story follows Simon Belmont as he fights his way to Dracula's castle and ultimately his date with destiny. This was a massive upgrade in every area from the NES releases. Characters and enemies are bigger and better animated. Backgrounds are loaded with tons more color and copious amounts of beautiful parallax scrolling. The gameplay sees major revisions as well. Simon now has full control over his jumps, which basically means you can jump, then pull back if you feel unsure or to get better footing. Your whip now attacks in every direction imaginable, including the ability to flick it and hold it out for flexibility in your attacks no other game in the series has captured quite the same way. Beyond that, Super Castlevania IV is a masterclass in visual art design. Every enemy purposeful in its depravity. The architecture is both familiar yet puzzling, as if designed by a madman trying to give the world a middle finger. Backdrops have entire other worlds happening in them. From horses lounging in fields to caverns deep with hollows, your eyes are always darting to the smallest of details to see what else is going on around you. The musical composition is the glue of the entire presentation. There is not one entry of this soundtrack that isn't excellent, that isn't perfectly melded to its stage, and every one of them invokes a powerful emotional response, whether it be a feeling of depression, loss, fear, or courage to keep fighting the good fight. Super Castlevania 4 is my favorite game on the Super Nintendo, and the pinnacle of 16-bit game design that few companies ever came close to matching. Having sat down and played these games again for long stretches, I can't help but be impressed by how well they hold up. Visual, sound, and gameplay are still top-notch in the vast majority of these, and while some have seen sequels and additions to their series, I can't honestly say any of them have aged badly against those. These games were so good and so well designed, I imagine people will be playing them well into the future. And that's something I loved about the fourth generation of video game consoles. Each one was so different from one another. Not just in the way they looked and sounded, but their game libraries were truly unique as well. At the time, you couldn't really play most of these games anywhere else, and it was the same of the better games on the Genesis and TurboGrafx-16. These systems, of course, had their third-party shovelware, but it was nowhere near the extent in the following generations. This meant that each system had an identity that was truly unique, making playing each one almost mandatory for someone looking for the most variety. Whether that meant owning and supporting both, or playing the one you didn't have at a friend's house, these systems had so much to offer those open-minded enough to give them a chance. While the Sega Genesis and its library were my favorites of that generation, I couldn't imagine that time period without the many spectacular games the Super Nintendo offered. I'm Sigalord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.